request to you all to please um, mute your mic if uh, you have turned your mic on just to make sure we don't have any disturbances. Abhijit, are we live? Yes, ma'am, we are live now. Okay. Um, can you mute um, people's mic except mine, please? Yes, it's uh, default. In default, it's all mute now. Okay. Um, I can hear myself. Is it, is it Patrick whose mic is on or Debra's? No, not mine. I think it's Patrick's. Yeah, it's, it's okay. done now. It's gone. All right. All right. Then. Great. Okay, um, we are live, right? Uh, Abhijit, we can start then? Uh, sure, I'll grant host to Patrick, sir. Okay, okay. I'm admitting, I... I'm admitting people right now, so give me a few minutes. No worries. Please let me know uh, and tell me that we can start. Sure. Uh, okay, ma'am, we can start now. Sure. I'm ready. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, those who are here with us in closed session of Zoom and those who are watching us in Facebook Live, welcome to the very first event of TBC Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. Hope all of you are keeping well and safe in these challenging times. I'm glad to see you all here. Thank you for making your time for this event organized by the British College. Um, TBC Distinguished Guest Lecture Series offers a space and opportunity to hear about the contemporary world, its challenges, opportunities, and more from the highly experienced scholars, practitioners, academicians, and researchers. We are thrilled to launch this talk series from today's date, and thank you for being part of this. To start off this series, we have an amazing Mr. Patrick McCrudden who has kindly agreed to speak on the topic of how blockchain is redefining supply chain management. Mr. Patrick is a senior academic lecturer with over three decades of business experience and a wealth of real life marketable expertise, possessing a hands-on participant leadership style, transferable skill set with an ability to integrate into a multicultural environment with a unique combination of detail-oriented mindset. He is currently a final year PhD student at University of Salford, UK, where he is researching on the topic of rice value chains in Myanmar with the intention of publishing in 2022. He completed his MSc procurement logistic and supply chain from the same university. He's lecturer of the field of supply chain management, integrated marketing communication, strategic HR, creative communication, innovative, et cetera. He's currently a partnership development manager at the University of West of England. UE is also a partner university of TBC for MIBM program and BBA program. Um, to take it further, I would like to briefly touch on the topic. You might be wondering why we have chosen this specific topic. Of course, it comes from the expertise of Patrick. Uh, also, to give you a very brief, um, supply chain is a set of sequential stages that conveys to the manufacturer of a product. Each stage may be handled by one of the many companies, suppliers, or stakeholders that participate in the manufacturing, transportation, storing of the products to the end consumer. Supply chain plays a critical role in the global economy. The International Trade Administration reports that supply chain transactions account for over 76% of the world trade. Companies aim to address the increasing supply chain complexity in areas of food security, supplier transparency, traceability, food waste, and more by adopting different technologies. However, these technologies lack transparent access to data on the status of supply chain. In today's contemporary and ever-changing world, business and customers are raising new demands for information on a product, such as authenticity, origin, quality, and sustainability. To address these challenges and find ways to resolve them, blockchain has been around as a promising technology. 
to satisfy many of the supply chain challenges. Hence, we chose the topic with the expertise of Patrick McCrudden. Today, the topic will revolve around the challenges and areas of improvements in food in, in all these areas with the use of blockchain. Just to give you the information, the paper I referred to for this information to share with you all is on the topic of how blockchain enhances supply chain management by three prominent authors, Dennis Holt, Dong, and Roberto of New York Institute of Technology and New Jersey Institute of Technology. To shed more light on this topic from the perspective of practitioner, researcher, and academician, I would like to invite Mr. Patrick McCrudden on the floor. Patrick, over to you. Ms. Sunita, thank you so much for such a gracious uh, piece of information. It was great. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Good morning for this uh, first in many uh, lectures, not only with myself, but for many others who will be involved with it as well. Um, I'd like to start to share immediately so we don't have too much delay. And what we have is a warm welcome to all of you. This is a little bit about me. Again, I, I, I have a substantial amount of, uh, I won't say expertise, but I've had uh, the privilege of working in many countries for different multinationals to achieve the ultimate goal of creating value within supply chains. Uh, we talk about supply chain management, which is really the movement of something from A to B. Uh, but ultimately, when we talk about a business structure and organization, it hopes to introduce value into that product or service. So when it actually reaches the customer, the customer is willing to exchange their hard earned currency for it. Uh, this is where supply chain management really uh, takes a leap of faith in the hope that all the time, money and effort and energy that the supply chain managers and people around in the logistics, etc., have put into moving this product or service uh, to the customer's hand that the customer says, yes, I'm willing to pay that much money for it. And everyone lives happily ever after because they've earned some profits, hopefully. But that's not always the case. And we're going to talk today about some areas which are quite, uh, I won't say they're quite new, but they're definitely moving faster or over the past 18 months. We've all suffered from various uh, problems with uh, the pandemics, etc. And there's been an, uh, a belief, a structure, an idea in supply chain that if we're moving forward to adopt better capabilities or resilience, then it might be uh, worthwhile to look at blockchain. Blockchain's been around for a while. It's nothing new. Um, we're going to talk about that today and how it might be involved uh, going forward in some, not all, supply chains. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, various opinions today on blockchain, what it is, what it can do, uh, what it might do within a supply chain and what it might not do in a supply chain. And ultimately, uh, could it be destructive? Could it be destructive in a supply chain in terms of uh, being more proactive to a buyer rather than a supplier? And could that actually uh, put suppliers out of business? Uh, six questions on the board at the minute were actually thematic questions taken from all of the questions that the students put together, which was great. Um, quite a few of the students had um, thematic. They were all asking similar, uh, you know, the similar question in different. But these are ultimately the questions that I hope to answer today, as well as introduce answers for many of the other questions which were provided. So when we look at uh, the first question, blockchain is used for supply chain management. How will it be deployed or could it be deployed in Nepal? Well, by the end of today, you're going to have an idea of what blockchain is across the supply chain. I'm not going to spend hours teaching you about, about blockchain. That might be for another uh, guest lecture. But we are going to understand what is blockchain. How can it be used and linked directly to a supply chain? 
predominantly uh, before we get going on this, personal thoughts is um, blockchain at the moment it really only has value if we're talking about a linkage to a food supply chain at the minute where we have food uh, traceability to make sure that the food isn't fake, isn't being contaminated, etc. So these are my personal views, having been in the, in, in you know, in this world of supply chain for many, many years. But that's not to say over the coming years that there isn't an acceleration to introduce block supply chains. But my own uh, initial belief, my own direction would be to first introduce it into food supply chains, predominantly fresh food supply chains. Uh, if you're wondering why I have that position, well, over the past 10 years, global retailers such as Walmart, Tesco, Carefor, uh, and others in the US, Kroger, etc., uh, they've been sizing their retail walk-in store footprints. So before you have these huge big stores, you walk in, you can be in the store all day long shopping, enjoying yourself. Uh, and those, those types of infrastructure stores uh, are failing across the globe, primarily because consumer buying behavior has switched. People now want to have fresh food, so they want to go shopping locally more often, rather than going to a large super center where everything you know is brought in and, and they buy maybe two weeks worth of shopping in one week, one day. Uh, now the consumer buying behavior switch where people want to go shopping you know every other day around inner cities uh, people want to go shopping out pick up some food some you know for that night which is freshly made today um, maybe have uh, salads that they purchased tonight they're going to have salad for tomorrow at work so it's more convenient but it's more localized so we're going to look at a blockchain uh, as a understanding across the supply chain and then we can discuss at the end where we see opportunities in nepal uh blockchain uh technology can it solve real world problems i think it can we're going to talk about that today and how it's deployed uh three how does ai and machine learning uh develop better with blockchain i'm going to explain how ai which is currently used in forecasting in supply chain and how machine learning actually extrapolates consumer buying recorded data uh, on, a, on, on a timely basis, meaning when you walk into a store like Walmart or Tesco and you have a loyalty card, well, that loyalty card is connected to you. It knows your name, uh, how you're gonna pay, if you're married, single, divorced, whatever. There's a lot of information that's collected on the loyalty cards. Uh, and the, the key information that's collected is your buying behavior. Well, that's the machine learning aspect. That's an in-house product, which is then extrapolating information on, you know, how often does Patrick shop? Does Patrick buy milk? Does he buy chicken? Does he buy beef? Uh, does he shop on the same day? This is the machine learning processes. Uh, that information is then captured and then shared to AI and AI then develops an algorithm on if it's going to reorder food again through forecasting, right? So that's how those two are gonna be linked. I'm gonna show you how that's done today. Uh, real case scenarios, we're gonna look at IBM, we're gonna look at Walmart, we're gonna look at uh, a honey uh, process uh, that I'm gonna show you going through uh, a blockchain scenario. And then at the end, we're gonna look at an organization that has adopted blockchain as a standard for itself to reduce fraud in the uh, red wine industry, and to also at the front end of the chain, allow consumers to click a QR code on their phone, on their iPad, if you go shopping with an iPad or a mini pad or a tablet of any kind, and you can actually get other information product that you're looking at or maybe considering buying, right? And we're gonna discuss how useful that might be uh, going forward. Ultimately, blockchain usage in supply chain, we're going to look at what would be good and what would be a waste of time. And liabilities, liabilities which are deployed because of blockchain and how good they could be. And when we talk about smart contracts, 
Well, it's a nice gimmick of a word. Smart contracts are not really smart at all. And I'm going to explain why. So moving forward, right? Uh, we're going to look at, uh, you know, blockchain technology. It's not new. It's been around for, you know, 10 years or so. Often blockchain is associated with cryptocurrencies. That's where we, we often hear about it. But really, when we talk about blockchain, it's the technology that's always been of interest to many organizations. It was just a cryptocurrency was the one that you know, gravitated. Uh, and that's why blockchain has a bit of a, a bad reputation because of that. But the technology itself is something which is very, very useful and can be deployed uh, in various ways. Supply chain management as a division across a network of global value chains or supply chains or even SO supply orientation, which is where one person is only selling to another actor, right? To be a supply chain, there has to be three actors, right? So when we say SO, it's supply chain orientation, there's only two actors. So that might be the farmer selling directly to a market, right? Where there's no third person in between. Uh, so supply chain management, we have numerous softwares that we use numerous softwares uh, you know 10 to 15 years ago if we uh, wanted to have a warehouse management system which was connected to some type of a purchasing system then what we would have is uh, an investment of about fifty sixty thousand dollars for a warehouse management system uh, today you can lease a warehouse management system in the cloud for 25 dollars a month so when we talk about software and applications and what we can do and what we can't do and what's useful, what's not useful. We, 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 you know, we're kind of done with software. We have enough of it. There are organizations uh, who uh, concentrate on using specific software, whether it's enterprise resource planning. That's quite good. It shares data with others, but it doesn't sh share data to all the stakeholders supply chain. What generally happens in organizations that are using uh, ERP is screenshots will be taken or an Excel file will be downloaded as CSV file and that file will be emailed to someone else in the chain who's trying to get information about you know, something that they're buying. So it's predominantly in-house stuff. It can be networked, uh, but it's not as useful as what we're going to see today with blockchain. We have production management softwares, we have processing softwares, but again, these are all really isolated. They're not interconnected. Even when, uh, I, and I've worked for many multinationals, either in stainless steel, global stainless steel, uh, global plastics, dynamic plastics. Um, all these softwares that we use are predominantly deployed in-house, so the information is kept in-house. Uh, that's the first, only one of the, negative aspects about this type of software is it provides too much data so much so that uh, people in the organization they turn reporting functions off for the simple reason that the data is overwhelming right data is coming out data is being pinged data is being emailed and if employees are not trained to to read data to understand data then what happens is they, they tend to turn services off, which is a negative in spending so much money on the, on the software in the first place, right? So blockchain offers a different dynamic. Right? First of all, there's three areas that we're gonna briefly touch on. The first is when we talk about a public blockchain, anyone can go onto the chain, you can uh, go into the, the main settings and see how the block is performing, when the block was sold, purchased, any new information has been updated. Anyone can do that, it's public. And that is usually assigned to a cryptocurrency chain, whether it's a Bitcoin or a Ethereum. I, mean, I think there's about a thousand different types of cryptocurrencies out there, if I'm not mistaken. If it's not a thousand, it's definitely a, a large number. However, when we talk about closed chain, right, a closed chain, what we're talking about now is a hyperledger. Now, for those of you who don't know, a ledger is just a record book of information. It's recorded, which is in-house, right? Not business processes, but how business is being transacted. 
who's buying what, where, when, and how, where it's been delivered, uh, how much it's cost to manufacture it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a ledger. So a blockchain, which is public, the ledger is public, meaning everyone can see how that particular block is performing. When we talk about a hyperledger, this is a closed blockchain, meaning there is a specific software, a platform, uh, you are invited to join it and it's closed and everyone on that chain is a stakeholder, right? So when someone does something to a block, everyone is aware of it. And if they accept it and they then click yes, accept updated, then those blocks cannot be changed. They're innumerable, unchangeable. And we're going to talk today the, the value of that unchangeability characteristics, right? When we talk about blockchain. And then we have the uh, hyperledger consortium where organizations are interlaced with one particular much larger supply chain, but still private, not accessible to the public. Uh, why is that important? Well, if I have a global company, I don't want to be sharing all my information with anybody who can just come into my supply chain, right? I want to make sure that what I'm sharing and who I'm sharing that information with is part of the supply chain, that unique environment that will allow uh, them, right, uh, and me to, uh, you know, develop a product or service and, and then deliver it to the customer, ultimately, right? So that's very, very important. Um, for beginners, those of you who are new to the idea or understanding a blockchain, uh, we're not going to spend too much time understanding the dynamic of blockchain, but blockchain basically is a series of collected data points, right? Each block, when it's closed, is encrypted. That encrypted code is used to open up the second block at the start. As more information, and when I say information, you can encrypt anything, links, video, you can copy paste anything into the block and it's recorded. The moment you want to close that block, that block is encrypted. The code that you get then becomes part of the opening block in a series, right? Therefore, if anyone goes back in time into the blocks and tries to change something, when they close the block, the block is re-encrypted and it's a new code. And that will be different to the second block. And then there'll be a big red line to say the block's been changed and everyone is aware that the block has been tampered with, right? So very simple. When you open up a block, you update, encode, copy, paste, uh, numbers, data storage, uh, invoices, billing orders, whatever you want to put into the block. The moment you close that block, the whole block is encrypted and you're given a code. That code is then used to open up the second block. That means block one, block two are connected with this encryption code. Then as you upload more information to block number two, and you say, right, block number two is now closed, that is encrypted with a new code. And that bottom code is then connected and used to open up the third block, right? So there's a constant block, which is linked to the previous block. If you change anything in the previous block, and you close it, it's re-encrypted, it's a new code, and the, the code at the bottom does not meet the code at the top of the second block, or third block, fourth block, and then it's identified as being broken. That's the security of blockchain, right? Very easy to understand that, right? The moment you change anything in any of the blocks and you close the block again, the encryption key will be different when it's re-encrypted. If you open the block and just look at the block and don't change anything and close it, it's going to use the same encryption key, which will be connected to the following block. Right? When we talk about what information is stored on the block, it can mean any. One of the downsides, the, 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 the propaganda, which is out there at the minute, which is kind of getting, the, get, getting in the way of organizations who are interested to engage in blockchain is the misunderstanding that uh, organizations have to share everything on the blockchain and organizations themselves are quite concerned of all sorts of reasons and secrets and I don't want to share that's not actually the case 
The only information that's collected on the blockchain is that what is, is agreed within the actual chain itself of those involved. Uh, so the, 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 the blockchain is initiated by, let's say, the retail company. Uh, they then initiate the block with the, uh, the vendor. I'm going to give you two uh, terminologies here. When I say supplier or vendor, it's the same thing. I'm giving you both terminologies because we use these on global value chains. So, uh, you know, a supplier is a person who supplies. A vendor is the term given to a supplier by the retail companies. So, vendor, supply, same thing. Right? So, the retail will give the vendor or the supplier a contract to, to do something for them, to make something or to grow something. Um, and only information is collected on that particular product itself, like growing rice, right? What seed did you use? Is the seed been recorded? Is it a seed which is part of the uh, International uh, Rice Institute? Does it have a code? That's happening. And that information is up uploaded to the block. When was it harvested? Right? What was the weather like? Et cetera, et cetera. Right? So only the information that's needed is uploaded to the block. Right? Uh, and, and that introduces added security features as well. Right? As I mentioned, once each block is closed, it's encrypted. Uh, you can always look at the block. So if we created a block of 10 blocks and we want to check block number seven uh, and number seven is up the supply chain, uh, we can open the block and we can see what's in there. But the moment we try to change anything and save the block, that block is then the chain is broken and everyone's aware of it. And people will say, well, why, why have you gone in there to change anything? Right. And that's, that's the added security. Blockchains, anyone can see, hyperledger, right? Nobody can see unless you're invited to join the chain, right? I'm going to explain a little bit more as we go forward. So here we've got Ginny Rometty. I'm sure you've all heard about IBM, how big they are, right? And, you know, old Ginny is screaming from the mountains how... Uh, anyone who engages in the IBM blockchain, which is in development as we speak, uh, we're going to save 100 billion. Well, you know, he's talking there about global supply chains, not local supply chains. And when we talk about global supply chains, we're, we're really looking at unique multinationals, Walmart, Tesco, Rogers, all the big buyers worldwide. Uh, and the targeting at the moment which I believe is, is the right way to go. It's the right way to go target food. Uh, why? Well, you know, there's $40 billion uh, worth of fake food in the market at any one time, right, worldwide. Any one time, fake food, food which is labeled incorrectly, food which is old, food which is contaminated. Uh, and that doesn't uh, even compare to the amount of food waste which we uh, find in food supply chains worldwide through poor management, uh, poor logistics, uh, ordering incorrect volumes. Uh, when we introduce the Forrester effect or the bullwhip effect, if we're talking academic, right? This is where managers who are untrained speculate, order too much food, and it's an oscillation effect where all of a sudden the manager in the retail store says, well, I think, you know, we're going to, uh, it's warm and sunny outside. So we're going to order, you know, more soft drinks and we're going to order more uh, meat because we think people are going to barbecue. Uh, and all of a sudden they, you know, they order, you know, an extra 10 kilos of meat or chicken. And the butcher says, well, I, I can't just order. I've got to order 50 kilos and this goes up the chain as an oscillation. And what happens? Well, there's no sun, it rains. All this food is wasted. This is very, very common in food. We waste huge amounts of food because of poor planning. And I'm going to show you today how blockchain with AI and machine learning is helping to reduce that waste. And eventually we might be able to reduce it down to a bare minimum, but it's going to take a lot of time, money, effort, and energy, right? Software itself. When we talk about blockchain, it's identified as SaaS, software as a service. IBM have been deploying for the last 15 months or so 
their particular unique style, their unique infrastructure of a blockchain. Uh, they're they're going to be selling this, deploying this globally. Um, it's working very well at the minute for some of the larger organizations. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Walmart later and how well they've been identifying the leafy greens that they've been using the blockchain on at the moment. Um, within the blockchain, those who are invited into the hyperledger are all part of the same order, right? So a supply chain is a group of people who are doing something that ultimately is going to provide to the customer a finished product. When the customer pays for that product, let's say $100, right, and they bought something, uh, everyone in the supply chain is getting a percentage of that $100. And hopefully their percentage is big enough that they've made a profit from it. So in supply chain, everyone's responsible to ensure that product or service is delivered at the right time, at the right place, uh, you know, to the person who's ordered it, so the consumer can pick it up and say, yeah, thank you very much, and I'm willing to give you $100 for that, right? So everyone is dependent on each other, and that's why I used earlier the term stakeholders. Everyone's involved, and if you're all involved, then you all should have the same information. And this is what blockchain provides. However, the initiator of the block, the one who registers the block, right, before giving the orders out, they ultimately can decide uh, how much visibility everyone in the block has to each other. As you'll see today, how much visibility, let's say, for example, the retailer is providing to the customer. I'm going to explain that towards the end, how much visibility is allowed. Because what, you know, as, as, as always, marketing companies have got, in, got involved now with blockchain to say at the front end of the blockchain, we can show so much information to the customer to maybe encourage them to buy more, right? Uh, but there's, there's pros and cons to that that we're going to talk about uh, later this morning. So there are benefits for those using blockchain up the supply chain, high at the beginning, right? Import, where all the inputs are brought in. Uh, benefits definitely for those using blockchain in the center of the supply chain, processing and at the uh, the bottom of the supply chain, which is retail and consumer. Right? But the question is that I'm going to put to all of you uh, in the back of your mind is, you know, is it worth it? I mean, do we have to have blockchain on everything in supply chain? So those are some of the questions we're going to be uh, looking at as well. So as I said, IBM, when they talk about software, right, as a service, Right, uh, they're looking at producing this global blockchain supply chain platform, right? Multinationals, right? When they're uh, deciding to embark on this, they're saying, yep, this might be something that we want to actually get into. Right? And of course, as I said, uh, the CEO of uh, IBM is, is going to say how wonderful it is uh, because he's selling it, right? Because he's selling it uh, as a software. Uh, when we're looking uh, down for what the academics might be wanting to say, the academics pull out terminologies that it's verifiable, it's unchangeable, and there's a, a citation there to say, yeah, uh, that's very, very good. Um, but the, many academics have not really got, got, got into it yet on how successful blockchain might be. Uh, it would be interesting to find out, um, well, most of the information that you get online now is predominantly white papers. And this is where we're, uh, we're, you know, we're identifying how uh, organizations are engaging with it. Uh, they're saying how much they uh, are using it in, in, in different parts of their business or which part of their business they might want to use it uh, in and why it might be better for them to actually use it uh, in as well. But there it's verifiable. It's in, uh, you know, swarming communications. Right? The information is collected. So blockchain is a process, it's a system whereby uh, it requires people and it requires uh, devices to be collecting data. Data can be air quality, data can be temperature controls, data can be time stamped, uh, uh, data can be track and trace of one thing being processed and sent from a factory warehouse position. So it's zap beeped out 
and then the time it's taken to get to the next location. So blockchains require inputs of data. Some can be automatic, uh, but many are manual at the minute where people are checking, right? People are checking how this is going to be done. So here what we're seeing really um, is how a standard uh, blockchain scenario would work. What we see is ultimately, I just got uh, lost here with everything. Sorry, this, all the stuff's got in the way there, all the screenshots, my apologies. So uh, letting people in. So we're looking here at a standard supply chain scenario where we have a helicopter view, which is showing us uh, how things might happen if some organized order something. And here we've got the, the processing side. So this could be a farmer, right? Uh, we're also uh, looking at maybe the traders that are going to get involved. Uh, we've also got food processors who might be involved with it as well, uh, all the way through. And often what we find is that uh, ultimately um, we have um, people in the supply chain who can see one step ahead or they can see uh, one step behind. This is very common in a supply chain, right? One step ahead, one step behind. But what we don't see is where the consumer can ultimately uh, identify um, where the food came from, right? Uh, ultimately, they cannot connect directly to the farmer, right, who's produced the food. Uh, they might be able to uh, go to the store and pick up the package of whatever they want to buy and then say, when they turn over and they see the, the, you know, the label, they can say, right, this has been by Z company. Uh, I know the name because it's on the back of the, uh, the product the label. It's got a website, it's got a phone number uh, if I need to call them. But what it doesn't identify is direct linkage uh, between everyone in this supply chain uh, to each other from start to finish or farm to fork. So if, for example, you decided that you wanted to buy sandwiches in, uh, in your supermarket, uh, the sandwich is going to be in some kind of container or it will be made fresh and placed in a container and then a label will go on. Uh, and the label will identify, uh, you know, the sandwiches, uh, a cheese and ham sandwich, for example, uh, and that's it. You're going to find out it's been made in the store or if the sandwich is pre-made somewhere else, you're going to have the name of the food producer, the packager, right, and how to communicate. What you're not going to know is if it's a cheese and ham sandwich, for example, uh, where the cheese came from, who made the cheese, what the ingredients are in the cheese, what the ham is, where the pig is, was the pig a happy pig? Who made the bread? Is the bread locally made? You're not going to get that information because the supply chain, as you see now, which is a standard uh, helicopter view of supply chain, uh, only really requires that the uh, supply chain uh, is connected and forms a connection with the next person in the chain forward and person back. So, so that's how supply chains are working and have been working for quite some time. When we talk about a conventional view of, of a supply chain, this is really uh, how supply chains have developed uh, over the, the, you know, the past few years, uh, especially when we talk about uh, how well they, uh, you know, when we talk about e-commerce, for example, uh, the e-commerce supply chain allows us to uh, purchase our products directly online. Uh, we say, uh, you know, we're, we're interested to buy something. so to one of the organizations, whether it be eBay or Amazon or shop.com, or if there's another uh, local producer in your area. Um, again, what we see is uh, you have access to who you believe uh, to be the, uh, you know, the, the ultimate owner of this product. And you buy it, right? You buy it. And uh, what you find is you can communicate directly with that person through one of these particular channels. But all you're doing is uh, gaining access to the group or the individual who's responsible for that particular product, right? Um, and 
whether it's food at stage one or it's a toaster at stage one, uh, you're able to say, right, I want to buy this. Uh, it's going to cost so much money. Uh, it's going to be delivered by this other company. It's going to get delivered on a certain day. And ultimately, uh, I can communicate with different people on the chain that's going to help me uh, get my product to my house uh, or to my business location, right? Uh, that's what we've been seeing uh, now for the past you know, 10 years, and it's been getting better and better. We, we, we do this kind of conventional uh, supply chain uh, understanding. This is a helicopter view uh, through website in integration. And, uh, you know, these apps work on your phone as well, but predominantly these applications that are saying, um, we have connected these various dots together. And if you deal with us, for example, Amazon, uh, we'll communicate with the buyer. Uh, we'll tell the buyer where you live. Or if you're buying direct from Amazon, which is called FBA, fulfilled by Amazon, it means that the buyer has already shipped their product to an Amazon warehouse, which provides security and safety if I'm the buyer, where I say, well, I know if I pay for this, the product is already at Amazon and I know Amazon's going to deliver it, right? So these are conventionals. But again, uh, Amazon or shop.com or eBay, as of, this moment, as of this moment, have not deployed, they may be considering it, but they have not deployed a blockchain scenario as yet. When we talk about, uh, especially in the UK or in Europe, one organization which has really uh, outperformed any of the other transportation companies such as FedEx or UPS uh, in Europe has been DPD. And this is a, a French company. Um, they, I'm at 2018, 20, well, 2017, 2018, they introduced a track trace app where not only could you order your product from anyone uh, and use DPD to pick up and deliver your product to you, but you could actually follow the GPS of the truck, the delivery van coming to your door. And it's very intuitive, very, very AI, AI in the way it was uh, you know, delivering information. It would, you know, the app would say you've ordered this thing, something from eBay or from the local store or from Amazon, and it's gonna be delivered to you uh, later today at one o'clock, your delivery number 26. And you could open up the application and see the, the delivery truck going to other locations around your area on a map. And if you were going out at one o'clock, uh, you could communicate directly with the driver on the app and say, look, I'm, I'm going to be out at one o'clock. Uh, could you be, uh, could you, you know, reschedule till two o'clock? Um, and that was a huge development. And my understanding recently is that DPD are moving ahead, right? I'm not sure what, what they would do with blockchain we should, what, what they're not already doing on their system. Uh, so that's something that we'll probably report back on uh, in, in the coming year to find out what they're doing uh, with blockchain. But it seems interesting that DPD being a logistics company is moving into blockchain. Uh, do they not believe in the encryption processes on the mobile technology? Don't know. But again, when organizations from logistics evolve, then th there's something there, there's something there, there's something there, uh, for sure. So how does this whole blockchain idea work? And I'm, I'm going to just keep this as, as brief as possible because it's not that complicated to understand, right? So blockchain in action, right? So products that are ordered are tokenized, means uh, if you order, and the example we're going to have today is going to be ordering honey. If you order honey from a, a honey producer, right? Um, the blockchain doesn't understand honey, it understands a token, a code, right? Uh, and that's what starts the information on the block, right? So everything that's ordered is tokenized, it becomes a token. And that token is followed throughout the chain. So every time something's updated on that information for the honey, right, the token, uh, it's recorded there and then, right? Um, and each product uh, that is ordered within the initial product. So let's say, you know, we're gonna be ordering uh, on our example, uh, 34,560 jars of honey, right? In the next example, uh, each jar of honey will have a separate blockchain identity, right? So when you go to a shop now 
and you pick up a bottle of water, at the back you'll see a barcode, right? Well, that barcode is the same barcode for every bottle of water made by that company in that particular one code says this is water it's called you know, let's call it uh, you know uh, mount everest water and that's it but when you talk about blockchain every individual bottle will have its own blockchain code which will be directly linked to the initial token the difference will be uh, the linear plus one scenario so you'll have let's say the token for our everest uh well, water bottle is code ABC123, right? Uh, the next bottle will be ABC123, and then the code will be one, and that will be encrypted as a new code, right? And then bottle number two will be two new code, but they'll all be linked to the initial token, right? So all the bottles of water will be tokenized, connected to the initial order, right? So it's very, very simple. It's numbers adding up constantly adding up you know, from the last one and when you type in code or you do a scan to make it easier a qr scan it will tell you information like yes this water is bottled in nepal it's uh, uh from a, a hidden spring mount everest it's the best water in the world and it's going to you know make you young right uh, or whatever you can put there the marketing side right it's all recorded as a token right so we have uh, just to recap, you've got the, uh, the actual order number, right, from the invoice. Then you've got the product code. Then maybe you've got the unit code. All this information is encrypted into a QR code, right? And the more products and the more locations you have is collected on that product, right? So it's a huge collection of data, right? Huge collections of data. And across the network, and now remember, I'm talking about a, hyper uh, ledger. So I'm, I'm saying that people in, in our network, in our supply chain, in uh, are all stakeholders, right? As the water is being bottled, um, and it, as each block is being completed, um, that information is distributed across the network of all to all those people who have been invited to join my supply chain network, because mine's private, right? Um, and that informs people of you know, the order's been complete, the shipment is being ready to be deployed, uh, make sure the truck, in, truck is ready to be at the ship because the ship's going to arrive on a certain date. Uh, and then there could be an introduction of a smart contract, which uh, is something that we're going to do, right? Something that we're going to do. Now, smart contracts, and again, at the minute, they're not smart, right? At the minute, they're not smart. Uh, the term smart contract uh, was first brought up uh, several years ago to explain that uh, at a certain point where data has been collected or a certain process that something's been done, then the smart contract, if there is one, you don't have to have a smart contract in any of the chains. But if there is a smart contract, then the smart contract would say uh, something should get done, right? So the example could be uh, a smart contract that when all the water has been bottled for our Mount Everest water, when all have been bottled and clean filmed, wrap fast, and are ready for shipment, right? The smart contract could say that when the bottles are loaded onto the truck, uh, payment will be made to the water supplier. Simple as that, right? Simple as that. But I'm gonna show you how smart contracts can deploy a mechanism of security, food security, and traceability. I'm going to show you how we use that going forward. Right. Smart contracts uh, are just uh, and if what do that that you've agreed to. Some of the downsides of smart contracts, unfortunately, uh, is that they're, they're not enforceable legally. Right. So you have a contract between you and a distributor. The smart contract is not part of the legally binding contract. Right. This is one that, 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 as of this moment, you know, that could change in the future. Things change, things develop. But right now, the smart contract is just, a, a, you know, if this happens, then do that. If that doesn't happen, then do this. Right. So it's just a process. And uh, at the moment, they're having difficulties introducing smart contracts 
into the actual contract between you and uh, a producer or a vendor, right, a supplier, right? Because it's just, if this happens, do that. If that doesn't happen, then do this. And so it's more of a process. Uh, and you know, things don't happen to plan. And the smart contract could be null and void because something hasn't worked in. You know, the vendor was late supplying the water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So smart contracts are not that smart yet, right? Not that smart yet. We're going to uh, go through the process, right? On the right side, you see the diagram, which is 10 stages. This is a retail process. It's very, very common. Uh, it's showing you different elements there, which is you know, what's logistics, where's warehousing, and, and the areas that are showing when happening by the processor. Uh, the areas which are showing uh, something being done, that this is value add. This is where we're adding value to the product. On the left side of the screen here, uh, you'll see the... Uh, the uh, diagram which identifies the, the terminology is who does what, where, when, and how in terms of blockchain. So let's talk about blockchain left diagram first. On the right side of the diagram, right, these are the user interfaces. You'll see that they're blocked because today I'm discussing a high public, a hyperledger, right? So all those involved right down uh, to the consumer at the bottom, producer right down to the consumer. When the block is registered at the beginning, assuming this is done by the retailer, so the retailer registers the first block. Uh, the third column, it says ID registration application. The retailer will register the block there and then will introduce which organization, which company, which vendor, which supplier is going to be linked to this particular block, right? And those involved, those suppliers, those vendors, Right. They'll all have uh, a block ID. Right. So the vendor has an ID, the retail has an ID, and these are going to come together and be registered as a block. Right. And then the retailer will invite other people into the chain, whether it's the producer, the processors, wholesalers, uh, transportation. Uh, they may uh, involve some external third party certifiers, the top left of the screen. Right. They, uh, like I said, Blockchain needs people as well as devices. These devices are identified as IoT, Internet of Things devices, where they're collecting information data. I mentioned earlier, it could be temperature, it could be uh, air quality, uh, it could be all sorts of things, timestamps, etc. It might even be, you know, be video. Right. Uh, you'll notice right in the center of the diagram, application tracking and recording. That's the block running, right? That's the block collecting all this data, whether the data is coming from individuals, human, or whether the data is coming from Internet of Things, which is being updated automatically, time stamped, as, 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 uh, as I mentioned. You'll notice the top file transaction data storage. The arrow is only pointing one way. Why? Because the data is closed. It's immutable, cannot be changed, right? It's fixed. And that's one of the added benefits, which... Uh, especially in supply chain, we see that as being a great benefit. You know, no one can uh, play around with the supply chain dynamic. No one can play around and maybe falsify documentation. No one can uh, say something certified if it's not certified. No one can uh, say it if it hasn't. Uh, and, and I could talk all day about the things which are positive about blockchain. But I'm also going to tell you today, uh, because I'm an academic, the bad things about blockchain, the things that concern me. Uh, about blockchain. So on the right side, we're going to see how this kind of would transact, right? Uh, so as I said, we're going to use Walmart as the example for the right side. Walmart itself uh, is engaged in resales, right? Walmart isn't really involved in any type of uh, food production, right? Uh, they don't cook any food. They don't uh, you know, well, they, they might bake some stuff on site, but ultimately what they're involved in is global supply chains and what, what it is they want to actually do with them, right? So Walmart would open up the chain. Walmart would record the first blockchain and Walmart would be thinking the chain that they've created uh, to, in my example, beekeepers who produce honey. 
Now, Walmart being a, a large global uh, food supplier, uh, you know, they have uh, a lot of uh, they have a lot of difficulties because they're dealing not only in time, right, but distance, right. So their supply chains can be very difficult to maintain and run because of those two factors, time and distance, right. So we're going to assume Walmart has contacted a particular honeybee operation in a different country, and they've ordered 34,560 jars of honey. Now, where, where do I get this number from? Well, 36 jars of honey per box, 48 boxes per pallet, and 20 pallets to a container. That, that's a nice round number, right? And it gives you 34,560 jars of honey, right? Now, because Walmart has introduced the block, we say, and invited uh, and provided an invoice to the hunters, right? The initial QR code is to uh, say that the block's now ready and Walmart is now going to introduce other people to the chain, which is a hyperlink. It's closed hyperledger, right? So they're going to uh, send the same uh, QR code to the glass jar manufacturer, the box maker, the label maker, the, the shipping company, the transportation company, and definitely they're going to inform their accounts department. They're going to say, look, we've an invoice. This company over, you know, across the water is going to uh, sell us 34,560 jars of honey. Right? So the block has now been created. Everyone involved in the block understands that uh, in a linear faction, as one process is completed, they will be aware of it. If there's any delays, they'll be aware of it. Right now we have transparency across the supply chain. Now everyone can visualize their supply chain. In the early supply chains that I discussed with you, you can't visualize it. You can only go back one person in the supply chain. If you're lucky two, but very rarely three, right? Because people uh, keep that information to themselves. They don't want everyone knowing who's in their supply chain. These are trade secrets, right? These are trade secrets. So the farmer of the bees has a blockchain ID. The Internet of Thing devices used in the production facility uh, have an, uh, an ID which is recorded on the chain. These devices might be taking time, uh, date stamps, temperature, uh, inside the uh, there could be Internet of Thing devices uh, con concealed inside the beehives, which are always recording the temperature of the beehives. Uh, the machines that extract the honey from the hives can have some kind of time date stamp when they were cleaned, last time they were used. All this data is being uh, collected automatically and uploaded to the block. Right? This is one of the the good, bad, and ugly things about blockchain. It starts off with a small database at the beginning, and then towards the end, it's a huge amount of data. Some of it is useful, most of it's not, but it's all traceable. It's all traceable. So let's go through a process of collecting honey, right? The farmer goes out, starts to collect the honey. The Internet of Things device says the honey is, uh, you know, this beehive is full. Uh, time to get the honey from this beehive. So the farmer tries to extract the honey from the beehive. When the farmer goes into the factory where honey is spun, right, to separate the honey from the actual honey cone, right, temperatures could be checked, right? The speed of the machine could be checked. The viscosity of the honey can be checked, right? And it's all recorded to make sure that it meets certain standards, right? When the honey is then taken from one machine to another or filling of the jars, there could be a timestamp uh recorded what's the difference between the first stage and the second stage is it within a certain criteria you know one hour for example and again temperature of the honey could be checked right uh, all by individually running internet of thing devices when it gets through the processing we need a human to check right so this is where a line supervisor who has an id a blockchain id will then confirm that the honey is correct, leaving stage one, the honey placed into the jars, the jars have been sealed, temperature has been confirmed, and the human checks to say, this is correct, 
at sealing the jar of the honey. Very important that supply chain have a human checking at that point, right? Very important. Once the honey goes through the machine, lid is closed, it then goes through the packaging into boxes, right? Now again, packaging to boxes can be done very easily. Uh, it can be done by machine, it can be done by people. Uh, but again, temperatures could be checked, how long it's taken to pack into the boxes, all this information is uploaded to the block, right? Once all the honey has been packaged and palletized, then another human from the warehousing department will check that everything conforms to correct packaging instructions. The wrap fasting of the pallet has been done securely. Uh, nothing is going to fall off the pallet. So we have another human checking that this has been done correctly. And that information is uploaded to the block. During this time, when I say uploaded, everyone on the chain in the hyperledger can see this happening. So there could be a trigger that when 80% of the honey has been packaged, that the shipping information is confirmed and the truck is sent out to go and pick up the honey. It might be two or three hours by the time the truck gets to the, uh, and by that time, all the honey will be packed, confirmed, uh, visually checked by the warehouse manager, a key person in a supply chain is a warehouse manager. And that individual is now saying, you can take the honey from the warehouse and it's get loaded onto the truck. So the truck now is aware of it. What happens? The truck checks time, date, stamped and temperature, right? So again, temperature uh, in this example is a key, key thing, time, key thing, because it's, it's honey, it's a food. You're gonna get honey uh, to the market in a fresh state as quickly as possible. So time and temperature in this example is identified as being a key requirement for the blockchain to be found out. Truck delivers the honey to the ship. Again, it's unloaded, the ship, as it's unloading uh, onto the ship, will again timestamp, check the temperature uh, and say, right, uh, we received it on the ship. Now, at this point, the farmer has finished his job, packaged the honey, honey has left uh, his facility, and now the honey has been loaded onto the ship. At this point, we could have a smart contract that says when honey is placed onto the ship, the farmer will be paid, right? This could be identified in the smart contract, right? But there could also be something else identified into the smart contract where the smart contract could say uh, if the honey, if the temperature of the honey exceeded a certain amount for a certain time for one hour into a red zone, then we're not going to receive the honey on the ship. We're going to say uh, because we've got the data coming from the, the data sets from the Internet of Things that says that during the, tr the transportation on the truck, the truck wasn't uh, air conditioned, uh, the honey got very, very hot, and it was recorded as high, so we don't want it. We don't want it to go on the ship. Uh, immediately, Walmart is informed of this temperature problem, uh, and they say, no, we don't want it, because the smart contract said, uh, if the temperature is kept within a certain amount, we'll take it. If not, it goes outside of that, right? A protective cover, then we're not gonna have it. And what's happened? Uh, Walmart, through a smart contract, has eliminated uh, a potential contaminant, a food contaminant, entering the supply chain. We couldn't do that before in any other supply chains, right? Because we don't have mechanisms to check what's happening within the supply chain. In blockchain, we can do that. Right? So there could be a smart contract that says, if the temperature of the product is outside of an approved temperature rating, Right, a scale, a range uh, for a period of time, then we consider the product to be uh, no longer valuable to us. And this is the case for leafy greens and, and lettuces, which are put in map bags. Maps is modified atmospheric packaging. Often you'll find salads in a plastic bag with, with kind of air. Well, we, we, we put a gas in to preserve, to extend the life of the, uh, the leafy greens, right? Well, if the leafy greens have been on a truck and the truck's very, very warm, 
then it doesn't matter what kind of gas we've got inside the package, the leafy green gets warm and starts to wilter, starts to you know, get all soggy and starts to drip. Well, when you walk into the store, you're not going to buy that. You're going to say, oh, look at that. It looks horrible. You're not going to buy it. Now, before we were unable to check that, but now uh, blockchain allows us to check temperature throughout. I'll give you another example. Uh, when I worked in the UK um, for a large plastic manufacturer, we would use uh, IoT devices to check uh, air quality and temperature of the plastic. When plastic is heated, it gives off uh, uh, gas and the gas can be quite toxic, right? So we were always checking the temperature of the plastic that we made and how quickly we could cool it down. Uh, we have lots of exhausts, uh, like you would find in a kitchen, to exhaust the gas out of the building and pump in fresh air. Um, and we would have different sensors that would check when we were molding the plastic into things. We would then place them in boxes and keep the boxes open uh, for up to 10 hours, depending on how big the plastic was, so that the plastic could cool down and the gas could get out of the box, not be contained in the box, before we would close the boxes. And again, we would use IoT devices to constantly monitor air quality and temperature of the plastic, right? That to ensure that we weren't um, having plastic which was warm, sealed in boxes, so that the customer, when they open the box, would suddenly, you know, get this smell, this horrible, and it really is a horrible smell of, of like a dried plastic. And if people breathe that in, uh, they start coughing and complaining. So to avoid that, uh, we would have uh, control, sensor controls for uh, checking the air quality, right? And also the temperature of the plastics, right? We would do uh, 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 how we would see an understanding of blockchain being used by, by Walmart, right, going through the stages, right? And where you see uh, stage one and stage seven, that's where we're trying to introduce value add, where we're, we're, we're making the product more valuable in the hope that we're going to get more money for the product, uh, but it all depends on if the consumer is going to buy it, right? The consumer doesn't buy, then, you know, you don't get very uh, upset with that. Uh, here is how we look at the, the stages, right? So, you know, we talk about food safety. You, you've heard me talk about a lot of food safety today. When we see on the top right of the diagram, uh, you know, certificate of origin, right, number one, right, batch numbers, processing dates. Well, th these are all usually uh, number sequences. Well, those numbers are recorded on the block, right? Uh, you can't change the uh, original documentation because it's part of a sequence, right? But if, you, if you'll notice uh, from the blue box, the blue after the uh, certification, starting at number 11, uh, continuation from 11 and 16 and 20, you'll notice that throughout there uh, and all the way through to 25, uh, temperature is, is constantly being uh, used as a key driver, right? temperatures being used, as well as looking at other types of codes. And we do that because we're looking for traceability across the supply chain. We want to make sure that if we buy rice from this farmer, that that is the rice that we're selling in, in, you know, in the retail shop to the customer. There hasn't been some change in the rice somewhere along the chain that we're not aware of, right? So blockchain is brilliant when we're looking at identifying traceability across the supply chain. It's also good um, from the retailer's perspective because it reduces spoilage, right? We know um, certification, time, temperatures, speed, delivery, the products come into the store very, very quick. Uh, it's fresh. Uh, customers get used to buying the quality. They're happy with it. Uh, and through machine learning and AI, uh, more products are ordered. Um, and checked continuously, and that improves the uh, traceability of the product. If someone comes in and says, yesterday I bought this salad, and I opened it up and there was something wrong with it, um, the organization would say, do you have the plastic wrapper? Or how do you pay for it? Did you use a credit card? Uh, do you have a, a loyalty card? Let, let, let's just check. They can immediately track trace backwards uh, what happened uh, to that, that salad, for example, right? 
So the traceability functions through supply chain for me is, is perfect, right? Uh, to eliminate any type of food contaminants, right? To reduce shrinkage and spoilage. Also, as I've mentioned uh, throughout this uh, talk, uh, a lot of the fresh food supply chains were dominated by time temperature, time and temperature. Uh, we want to get the food uh, to the consumer as quickly as possible in a safe, controlled environment. So we might be using uh, controls such as HACCP, hazard analysis, critical control points. They could be interlinked to uh, Internet of Thing detectors, right? Well, that's a globally recognized food safe, right? Uh, governments in many countries have food safety regulations right, that they deploy that everyone has to follow, right? And if you fail to follow these, the companies are fined by government bodies. My health and safety executor in, in the UK, for example, will find uh, companies who fail to protect the consumer, right? But one good point of a smart contract is the ability to uh, add in a criteria function. If this criteria is not met, then we don't want the product entering the supply chain. And as I mentioned the criteria earlier, it could be driven by temperature, right? Could be driven by temperature. So if the Internet of Things temperature devices have picked up that there's been a sudden spike in temperature during one of the stages, uh, that's recorded. And Walmart could say uh, at any stage, at any stage, you can mute your mic, please, whoever that is. If at any stage, uh, of the supply chain, that the temperature goes out this range, then we don't want the product on its journey. We want it to be stopped there, uh, either checked by a human to make sure everything's okay. You know, the Internet of Things device on the truck could be malfunctioning. So, so the criteria could be that it has to be checked. Uh, they can then continue uh, and say override that delay uh, in terms of the smart contract and the, the product uh, can continue on its journey or the human could say correct the internet of things temperature is right uh, and we've blocked that from entering the supply chain and again we've never been able to do that before so for that it, you know it really really is uh, fabulous this first statement i'm sure i don't know I'm, but I'm sure that this is a statement that the people at IBM are using when they are selling the idea of the IBM blockchain, right? They're saying, imagine Walmart, right? I'm just paraphrasing here. If you could see across the whole landscape of your supply chain, uh, uh, how wonderful that would be, or maybe the salespeople would use something similar. Um, but it's very intriguing. If someone came into my office and said, Hey, Patrick, how would you like to visualize your supply chain in a second? I'd be interested. I'd be saying, yeah, show me how to do that. With blockchain, it's possible. And it's possible primarily because uh, all the data points are continuously collecting data, right? Continuously collecting data. And from what I understand, I've seen some screenshots of the IBM uh, and parts of different groups, uh, IBM are very smart now. What they're doing is they're visualizing the data. They're not just showing you reams and reams of numbers, but they're visualizing the data for you to make it easy for not just a supply chain person, but any person who can say, right, this is working over there because it's all green, it's all done. It's now moving over here. So it's like a transition of colors. Uh, from green to blue, and people can say when it gets all blue, it means that the product has gone from one stage to another stage, and it shows you temperature, uh, time, date stamps, and I'll show you how that works today. And it's, uh, it's, it's very, very exciting, right? It's very, very exciting. And ultimately, right, being exciting means it's uh, worth paying for, right? It's worth paying for. And uh, I'd be interested, right? 
Uh, Walmart there, they've published some astounding information where they've said, you know, it took close to seven days to trace mangoes in one of their stores. I mean, seven days is pretty good, actually, uh, when you're trying to track and trace using uh, the old style systems of uh, calling farmers, speaking to truck drivers, speaking to distribution centers, asking if this particular batch has arrived. I mean, it's time consuming. You know, you call up a distribution center, it might be in another country. So you've got time problems as well, right? But for those to, you know, to click a button and find out where all the mangoes are in 2.2 seconds, that is phenomenal, right? So that's the first stepping stone that, the, the, you know, the wow factor, the amazing factor. Um, but it's not great throughout, right? It's not great throughout. You can also say that using blockchain on luxury items, right? Yeah, that could be really, really good as well. Uh, you know, the ladies who are here today, you don't want to be spending three or four thousand US dollars on a fake handbag, right? That was, that's only going to upset your day. Uh, but the same could be for, you know, watches or diamonds, blockchains. There's a De Beers has a blockchain for diamonds, which they've been running for the past year, which is quite successful, right? You, you, know, you pick out a diamond, the diamond's recorded, uh, which diamond cutter is, is created, what kind of diamond has been finished, polished, and where the diamond is right now in a piece of jewelry or for sale. So that's, you know, that, 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 that's, that's very interesting. So blockchain in food, most definitely. Fresh food, absolutely. Uh, frozen food uh, in the future. How long is the future? Well, next year would be good, but it's not going to happen. Uh, dry food, grains, <sighs> difficult because of the volume, the size. Uh, track and traceability at the minute in farming is quite good at some points. Um, Blockchain in those areas might be a little bit longer coming, a little bit longer coming. So barriers, I've told you about how wonderful blockchain is, but what are the barriers? It's expensive, right? For some organizations, it could mean make or break, right? For other organizations, if we're talking about global value chain managers, they could introduce uh, buyer behavior, which is where buyers come to suppliers and say, I'm going to give you a large order. You better do this, that, and the other for me. Otherwise, I'm going to take my order and go somewhere else. I fear that organizations such as Walmart, such as Tesco and other large retailers uh, could institutionalize the idea that if you want to be selling to us, you need to upgrade uh, and move into a blockchain world, blockchain environment. So you have to uh, buy the technology, you have to maybe register uh, as a purchaser of the IBM software, for example. Uh, you have to fit out your organizational structure, building facility with IoT devices. You have to hire and train, hire new staff who understand this, this technology, then you have to train your staff to participate in the technology. So I'm very cautious about that. And from an academic standpoint, uh, there is substantial, substantial academic uh, information that has identified where uh, global value chains has been very aggressive uh, on suppliers, uh, you know, very, very, you know, bullying yes but you know a very aggressive in, in demanding pushing expenses up right upstream right retailers uh, have, have been characterized of trying to offset some expenses that they should bear and pushing it up upstream and making the the vendors or the suppliers uh, pay for you know pay for those so their profits get bigger and 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 the vendors are ultimately responsible for uh you know for these upgrades so my fear is that as these organizations deploy blockchain technology uh it could introduce huge barriers to entry for 
you know, for small, small players in this world and small trades because of the cost of the equipment. Uh, IBM are not going to give this software away. Phew, absolutely not. Uh, they're going to be charging uh, whatever they can. They're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in this. So they, they want to get a, a fair return. Uh, Internet of Things, these devices, they can be inexpensive or they could be expensive. It depends what you want the device to do, right? Uh, these vendors, these suppliers, you're going to have to have a high speed internet access to be uploading all this data in real time, right? Uh, you know, you're in Nepal. My specialty is supply chain rice value. I know, well, I think I know a lot about rice and I know a lot of farmers, but, uh, you know, they can be 50 miles away from the inner city with no electricity. How are they going to get uh, high speed internet access, right? So again, this is another, another barrier that they can uh, get, 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 you know, uh, they can uh, be, be difficult for them to uh, get involved with because, because of these various barriers, which is a shame. So although the technology is good, it sounds great and wonderful. And um, yes, I can find out where my leafy greens are or where my mangoes are in 2.2 seconds. The question is, they could only do that because the people who have taken on the uh, the upgrade, the mangoes, obviously, you know, supply mangoes at huge quantities to Walmart, and it was worth their their financial interest to do so. Uh, I enjoy these Internet of Things to to get into uh, the, the the software uh, systems of IBM because they're up to obviously got a big contract. So if you're a vendor with only a small uh, contract, would it be worth your while? Right? Would it be worth your while? So but that itself could be uh, a substantial uh, barrier going forward. Um, I want to now go downstream and discuss what's in it for you and me, the consumer, right? What's in it for us? Uh, blockchain sounds good, uh, but it only sounds good if you know, you're a stakeholder and you're part of a, a, a nice, neat group of people and you're all friends and you're all making money. Well, you know, that sounds great. But the initiator of the first block, which in this case would be, in my example, Walmart. Walmart has control of the access or gateway of how much information is shared between all or none. And that includes the consumer. As each block is finished, each stage is finished, and the block is closed and uploaded, a new, a new QR code can be created. So you have a various lists of QR codes at different stages of the actual invoice. And the last one would be when, uh, in this case, Walmart has received the honey, right? They've received the honey. But uh, at that point, they can create a code during the packaging stage that says, this is the code that I want in the package, and this is the code that I want the customers to see. And the customer picks up their, uh, their mobile phone, right? And they scan this code, then I want the customer to be sent to this website or see something about the product, right? And this is where the marketing department comes in because the marketing are now saying, wow, this is a potential for us to engage the consumer in understanding more about the product, more about this, you know, where it's come from, the origins and uh, what type of honey it was and how old the bees were and if the, the bees are in a nice, beautiful farm area with fresh air and you know, blue skies, etc. Um, and that's controlled by the retailer at the packaging point. So the retailer can announce right at the beginning of the order, right, at packaging, after the processing, the packaging label has to have this QR code on it, right? The packaging process in the shipment that can have a separate code which allows everyone in the block right everyone in the block itself to see what's happening but the individual item of honey a qr code on that which has been pre-arranged by in this term this kind of example walmart and that's controlled by walmart and the the in the marketing what we want people to know about this product called honey right which is something that is growing in popularity, right? And although it looks interesting, right? Um, you know, it's market driven. It's no more about the products, might increase sales. It might be the difference between uh, you 
buying this product because you've done the QR code test and you say, yeah, this sounds great. I'm going to buy it. So you might buy it because of the QR code. No, nope, you know, there's no information yet to say that. It would be interesting um, to, you know, to, to read any papers. I haven't found any yet where the QR code has been checked and there's been some kind of surveys done uh, by different retailers that say, yes, we've increased sales. Uh, uh, people checking out the QR code. Now, my question to all of you is this. Um, would you do this? Would you walk into your store, pull out your mobile phone, right? Open up the, uh, the bar scanning app and be scanning all the products uh, to find out all about them before you buy them. Would, you know, would you do that? I'm like, that's my question to you, right? I would not, but I would with one or two products. Every product, I would not. I, I don't have the time to go into, uh, I'm in Thailand, and we shop at Tesco. Um, I don't have the time to go around shopping, holding my uh, phone in, in hand and scanning all the QR codes to find out uh, where the product came from, etc. But I would do it, and I have done it uh, for certain products, right? For certain products. And the product we're going to look at today uh, is here. It's a wine product. And we're going to actually click this. You can actually scan this. So uh, if you've, you've, you should have the P PDF of today's lectures. If you scan this code, uh, I'm going to click it, and then I'm going to, uh, as we move on to the sharing, uh, I'm just going to transfer the sharing across now to the website as it opens up. Just waiting for the website. We've got a monsoon here at the moment, so things might be a little slow. This should be loading now as I hold my breath. Coming up. So if you scan right, that code, imagine you're in the store, you're looking at a bottle of wine and you say, oh, look, it's got one of those new scans. So you decide you're gonna press the scan and this is what is gonna open up on your phone, on your screen. Uh, it's very intuitive, right? I just apologize for things being a little bit slow here. Uh, you're gonna say my story. There should be a picture which identifies the screen, right? It should be showing, I'm gonna just gonna refresh that again. We should see a bottle of wine. As I say, apologies for the internet here. We, we've had rain for two days. There's the QR code on the top, right? Here you're seeing now uh, the product. If you'll notice here, this is the agronomy is talks about the trees, which is the, the vines itself growing the wine. Push you uh, the dates over here. Look at the harvest. Right. So these are pictures. Right. This is all from the right. And one thing I want to show you here is that's the blockchain code right there. If I type, if I'm a vendor or a supplier and I copy paste that code into my IBM, right, real time system, it will match and say, correct, this is 100%, right, original, right? If we move across to some more information, here we're going to click the uh, vinification. This is where the wine is brought in, it shows you the date. Right, cold pressing, fermenting. I'm now finding information out about the product itself. And lo and behold, right at the bottom, there is the blockchain code. There's only one code, one product. There's not one code for multiple products, right? And if I'm in the store and I'm looking at all this information, I'd be interested and say, you know, it's, it, it sounds amazing, right? It sounds amazing. And there's the bottling being done, right? How interesting, batch numbers, 
right? This is where the marketing group comes in. It talks about the territory, right? Read more, explore. Oh, there's where the wine's grown. Oh, sounds wonderful, amazing, right? Different facts about the product, alcohol level, right? It's a combination of different wines here. That could be very, very interesting, right? Right, consumption, get it finished by 2022. I don't know anybody who buys wine and doesn't consume it within 24 hours, right? I'm not, I'm not somebody who would invest money in wine and keep it, uh, you know, in a dark room somewhere, but it's telling you information here. Uh, optimal consumption, that will be following a Food and Drug Administration regulation to show that information. And it's also telling us how and where to store it and uh, how, to, right, how to enjoy it. So this information right, is all driven from the QR code itself, which is displayed on the bottle right on the bottle right so back i'll stop sharing there and go back to uh, the slides so here's a qr code and you can try it yourself if you have a, a scanner you know reader which you can download from either android or you know apple store uh, once you click that uh, you'll find out everything that i've just shown you online so that might be something Right? Not saying it is, but it might be something that people would find interesting to do. But the question to you a few moments ago is, would you do this for every product in the store? And me personally, no, absolutely not. I'm too busy. And the other thing that blockchain uh, is bringing to the supply chain, especially to the retail market, is it's that added security, that benefit of trust and uh, consumers, as they did when we introduced ISO 9000, HACCP, ISO 9001, food safety regulation, all these types of things, they, they bring a, a level of trust. And consumers who shop regularly in large organizations like Walmart, Tesco, et cetera, et cetera, some of them, uh, they automatically think, well, the owners are responsible. They're not gonna have any contaminated food in here. That's going to, you know, to me. Uh, and I think although the QR code scenario can work for a few, I don't think it'll work for everybody. It might be, you know, at the beginning, oh, check this out. But I don't think it's going to be something that consumers are going to do on a regular basis because they're too busy and they'll be, uh, they'll accept the convenience and the trustworthiness of it. But I'm sure you'll find other people who would uh, engage with it, but uh, on select items. On select items directly. Briefly, different types of blockchains, as I mentioned earlier, uh, public is always identified with crypto. You can literally uh, go onto any crypto website right now and look at how the chain is performing because it's all public. Um, on a hyperledger, uh, you can't. You'd have to be invited in. You'd have to download some software. You'd have to be uh, checked. It's quite, quite, uh, quite annoying actually, because uh, I'm part of a few uh, test blockchains. Um, you, know, you send an email off. They send you a text message. You got to do something else. They send you another link. You got to do something else. Then they want photo ID. Then something else. So you know. But once you've done it, once you're on the ledger as a stakeholder, that's it. You're in. You got your ID and you can, uh, if you're a, a third party person, like I would be as a supply chain uh, consultant, I would have my third party ID as me, my ID, okay, because there's only one Patrick, right? So that's how you would find me on the blockchain. So if you were providing some service uh, within uh, the supply chain, you as an individual would have your unique ID. You would not have to keep renewing or going on and saying, hey, I had one before, but it's gone. I've lost it. You would, you would have uh, have your own ID. Um, and then Bitcoin, any of them. There, there are many blockchains out there now which are public and easy just to get access to. But it's public, right? It doesn't have your name on it. But it's public. You know what's going on within the chain. Right? Uh, private chains, it's not public. It's closed. You have to be invited in. Uh, and again, 
you know, if we, if we use Walmart or Tesco or Kroger's, you know, they're only going to invite suppliers in to their hyperledger, right? Or, or, or third party people who are providing some type of service. Uh, there could be an external service checking something, right? Uh, not just uh, having autonomous monitors like Internet of Things doing something. As I mentioned before, uh, these things can break. So if all of a sudden the blockchain announced uh, a temperature control has gone outside of the range, right? Uh, you are going to get a human to go and check to make sure, because the last thing you want is uh, to believe a machine and find out the machine is wrong because it's faulty. And then you've just discarded a container of honey, for example. Right? So there will be a demand for uh, people and that demand for people, they have to be trained. It costs money. Right, it costs money, and again, that that's going to be a real, a real issue, and it, and it it's turned out to be uh, an, an, an issue in uh, in many organisations. So I'm going to summarise, and I, as I said, all the questions that you proposed earlier, I I, I kind of put them into different themes, but I'm summarising here that yeah, multiple products you know, and services they could be deployed across a blockchain, but the question is. Would you use blockchain in every single supply chain? And at the minute, I would say no. Uh, fresh food supply chains, yes, 100%. The quicker we get those in, the better. Um, food supply chains in general, yes, that would be also a must for me. Uh, track traceability, food security, big issue. Uh, we've had different scandals over the years, whether it meat scandal, chicken scandal, you name it. Uh, I don't want to be eating food which is going to, uh, somehow injure me or my children, for example, right? Advantages in the pharmaceutical industry, blockchain, absolutely, absolutely. There's huge uh, difficulties in pharma with fake products. I mean, terrible. These people must be horrible to uh, introduce fake medicines into supply chains. And, you know, we, we don't get it right all the time, supply chain people. You can't check every product that goes onto a container. It's just, it's just not possible, right? Um, but with supply chain, we should be able to introduce, and we will be able to introduce, mechanisms of a combination of people and Internet of Things and stages, time, right? or makes it very, very difficult for these corrupt people uh, to introduce uh, fake products, whether it's food or drugs or wine. Right, or fake handbags, right? Brands, big, big companies have gone into, uh, when I say big companies, probably luxurious organizations have gone into blockchain in their own way, in a big way, because they want to reduce the amount of uh, copies of fake products because it brings the, uh, the brand down, et cetera. Uh, buying online, um, direct to the store, that's one way. Uh, but how do you know, you know, it's, it's a real online store. There's so many websites out there which have been identified as fake. Um, Alibaba got into trouble. And again, it's not when I say Alibaba, it's not Alibaba's fault, but people were selling uh, fake products through the Alibaba system. Also, Amazon has had the same problem. eBay, uh, they had this 20, you know, 20 years ago with fakes being brought into the market. So blockchain uh, has a lot of positives. Right? What are the barriers? Big one is cost. Um, IBM is not going to give you or give anybody their access, right, to their new blockchain uh, hyperledger uh, for free. I doubt very much it's going to be something which is cloud accessible. It's going to be a standalone system where you'll be you'll be logging directly into uh, IBM. That's that's what I'm seeing at the minute. That's what people are telling me as well. Uh, so it's going to be expensive. So if you're a farmer growing food outside of Kathmandu, you may say to yourself, well, I don't have the money to suddenly scale up onto this thing called blockchain, right? So maybe I, I won't be able to sell my rice anymore to, uh, you know, to this, this larger group. Um, so that could be a barrier, right? The costs of getting into this, uh, this upgrade. Then you're talking about hiring people who can engage and understand what blockchain means across the supply chain. And two, uh, the retraining of people to engage in the collection of information, the timestamps, the security, the visual checks, 
right? Now, at first, people uh, employed in companies may be reassigned, right? Saving of money. But ultimately, if they're reassigned and they've got their own personal ID, they may say, no, you're working me too much. I want more money or I'm going to leave, right? So there's going to be all sorts of uh, human resource management issues where people might say, no, I'm not trained to do that, and I don't want to do that. That's always a, an issue with leadership. Uh, someone is asked to do something, and they say, no, I don't want to do that. That's not my job. I, I'm happy doing that, that job, and that's all I want to do, even if you pay me money. So there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's substantial barriers to, uh, you know, to entry. Uh, one of the downsides that, I, that I've mentioned that I feel to be one of the most uh, difficult, uh, and it, you know, it could happen, is where... Uh, retailers, right? If you want to be part of our supply chain, you've got to upgrade. If you if you don't do it, then we're going to take our business somewhere else. Organizations who take on that that mantle, you know, they, they say, right, Walmart, for example, we will do this. Organizations see this as a uh, a strategic move where they can be uh, engaging to up, you know, upgrade their entire system to move into blockchain. Get the Internet of Things, do the training, hire the staff, right? So their strategy will be to have a competitive advantage, right? Uh, but it's sustaining a competitive advantage. How would they sustain a competitive advantage? Well, if the competition then decide to engage in blockchain and hire and train, and et cetera, then, you know, uh, that competitive advantage has uh, been lost. But if an organization can retain that edge of blockchain, and also uh, have good contracts with these multinationals, then ultimately the multinational is, is you know, not going to uh, chop and change to go from one uh, supplier to the, you know, to the other. You can see a reason why they should switch suppliers, right? Um, when I worked in China for Frankie as the strategic supply director, um, we actually had a very large account with Walmart China. Uh, large account. It's $100 million a year. And we've had bigger, but yeah, it's, it's a big enough account, I suppose. 100 million is big. And it was supplying Walmart with stainless steel, refrigerators on the countertops, all this kind of stuff. And the first main contractual agreement that we were getting in, 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 into them with, they were telling us, uh, about suppliers and costs and transportation. They wanted to know all this information. Of course, we refused to tell them uh, because that was our information. And uh, I had to go to Bentonville with uh, Abhishek, uh, my uh, sales manager, uh, who became the director, uh, to save the deal. We were losing the deal. The 100 millions were gonna, was, was, was you know, drifting away. And we went to Bentonville uh, for a sit, sit down to find out how we could save this. And they said, look, the reason why we want to find out about who your transportation is uh, and how much you pay is not because we're trying to find out because we're going to do something, because we want you to use our transportation. Ours is cheaper than anywhere else because Walmart own their own trucks, their own shipping, everything they own themselves. Uh, and they're all, they own their own ports in America. They say, if you ship with us, it's cheaper. And if it's cheaper, that means you can reduce your price. And if you reduce the price, that means our customers pay less. That was their mentality. So, uh, and that was a strategy. And uh, in terms of blockchain, uh, it's quite likely that if you as an organization decide to have that competitive advantage and you move into blockchain and you're the first mover, Walmart would probably stay with you long term and not switch because Walmart is still with Frankie now. That's 20 years ago. Uh, what Walmart have is an internal policy of working with the vendor, developing the vendor to be even better at producing what they do so Walmart can buy more at a cheaper price. So again, the idea that blockchain is going to be suddenly deployed onto a supply chain at huge expense for someone like Walmart or Tesco, and Tesco not use that as being valuable to Tesco, when we talk about value within a global logistics supply chain uh, would be foolish, would be foolish. So I believe that those organizations, those vendors, those suppliers are just waiting, just waiting for IBM uh, to say, right, we're ready. And they're going to be 
knocking on Walmart store saying, I want to be the one who upgrades first. Uh, can, can you, you know, give me as much or as many of your orders as you can? We'll absorb the cost. We'll do all the training, the hiring, the internet of things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they can have that competitive advantage. Now, what does that mean uh, for everybody else? Well, companies are going to go out of business. Companies are going to go out of business. They might be absorbed by other larger organizations. That's my worry. Small farmers are going to be uh, victims of technology. They're not going to have either the expertise, access to funds, access to people, uh, access to the internet if they're, if they're very rural, right? So that could be a real, real issue uh, going forward. Um, you know, we talk about customers having access. You know, uh, yeah, it's good. It's nice. Go on, you know, click a button scan the code, find out about the wine. But how, how, how useful would that be to the everyday shopper, right? The everyday shopper, um, I don't know, maybe at the beginning. Uh, but if, I, if I've done it once, a particular bottle of wine, uh, and I know the brand, then maybe I won't do it again for that particular brand. I might be happy to purchase other, other products. Uh, so that has to be something that's uh, researched uh, later on. Um, but with this blockchain deployment, uh, with uh, the amalgamation of organizations who upgrade, centralize, uh, it could be uh, good for them, the supplier, uh, but it could ultimately be something that the consumer loses out on varieties where suppliers just go out of business uh, and, you know, there's no more. When I was a kid growing up in the north of England, I used to love summertime because we, you know, we could get access to all sorts of local berry fruit. But in my early 20s, uh, the local fruit was gone. It was no longer more. Uh, and the reason for that was uh, Tesco's and Walmart was in, importing cheaper fruit from uh, other locations around the world, Portugal, Spain. So the local fruit growers in the north of England, uh, they, you know, they went out of business because of the, you know, the, the large multinationals who are able to buy fruit grown in another country much cheaper, ship it into the UK and basically sell, uh, sell that fruit at such a uh, more uh, affordable price than the local fruit. Right? I'm glad to say, though, that the local fruit has had a bit of a comeback, uh, more local go green. Right? But you still have now access to imported fruit from, from Europe, from South America uh, and the locally grown fruit, which is predominantly around the uh, early spring, summer time. Right. So there we go. I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, there's a few questions which have popped up. Uh, I hope I haven't gone too broad uh, and on the, not only my personal views or visions or understandings, how I see blockchain, at least over the next three to five years, uh, entering uh, into our world from a consumer position. Uh, but I do feel, and this is something that my colleagues at different universities, predominantly at Salford University, where we have a very large uh, group of supply chain uh, academics, we believe that blockchain can add strategic right, benefits in fresh food supply chains, food supply chains in terms of uh, security and traceability. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Maybe Sunita, you might have a couple of questions to start off with. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk for too long. No, not at all. Thank you for a very interesting and insightful um, you know, discussion and conversation on this topic. And I'm sure all of um, us who have joined um, you know, your session in Zoom, they are there with us, you know, they are, they're sticking with us, which means I'm sure everything that you've said, they found interesting. <laughs> there are a couple of questions. Let's take a couple of questions from there. I'm filtering them because um, we, we are tight on our schedule. Uh, I'm filtering them based on the information that you've shared. So I, I will pick some questions and you can share your light on them. One of the questions that has been asked by is uh, Nirpa Thami. Um, he asked the question, how blockchain would be usable for humanitarian supply chain? 
Um, I think he's asking from the perspective of humanitarian response um, for the blockchain implementation. Yeah, and I try to touch on that. Uh, when we talk about humanitarian, it's deployment of something. Let's say it's drugs, medication. What we've noticed uh, across the world for many years is how fake products uh, enter these supply chains, whether they're humanitarian or regular supply chains. Uh, blockchain will eliminate, because of the way it collects data so quickly and uploads that information to a blockchain, uh, especially we talk about time stamping data, it makes it very, very difficult for any uh, foreign actor to enter the supply chain and change something, switch something without it being recorded or noted. Secondly, at very specific stages of the pr process of the supply, we have human interaction and you know you would hope that not everyone who's in your supply chain is corrupt that uh, he's switching things over uh, from real products to fake products um, there's no amount of, of data uh, or long limitation of data that you can upload to any of the blocks so that could even include video data in real time right so you could be uh, have your pharmaceutical drugs, could be Pfizer, could be anybody, uh, checking all the ingredients coming in, uh, understanding the supply upstream where all the input. That can all be recorded uh, going through the process. Everything could be real-time video, packaging, real-time. Uh, the QR codes placed on sealed, if it's drugs, sealed products all in real-time. The shipping companies would be vetted, being sealed uh, all the way through to distribution. Uh, straight through to the, it could be delivered to a plane and then it's taken by plane to another secure location. So everything is time stamped. If all of a sudden there's a 24 hour time stamp gap where there's no human eyes on the ground, that would be an immediate uh, contractual stop, right? A smart contractual stop, which would say, this has not been secured. We don't want the product, right? Instantly. And that means that that product does not enter the supply chain, right? So in the example that I gave for the honey, right? The temperature controlled, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. The Internet of Things device has said, this honey has been in a very, very warm container for three hours. Uh, it's, it's been in a red zone for one hour. Uh, we need a human to check and if the human checks, with a physical temperature and says, yes, my goodness, or looks at the honey, and maybe the honey is separated, right? Uh, then, the, then the human would say, yes, the contract now states that we will not permit this honey to continue into the supply chain. Or, no, the Internet of Things device is wrong, the honey is fine, perfect. And then that person is the eyes on the ground. He or she will permit, through a code, to allow the honey to continue along its journey. Right. right. And I'm sure this can also be applicable. The similar approach can be applicable, especially for the, you know, vaccines delivery um, and the supply chain. Somebody here, the Besh or Raj Baide has asked a question or rather made a comment on could blockchain be a great use case for a vaccination program? Um, and he also mentioned that this is a time when certification of vaccination seems quite a huge problem for the government around the world and um, you know he's asking about uh, i think he also wanted to know more other than the vaccinations about the travel tour education and he wanted mm. to understand how blockchain can be implemented in other sectors as well mm. it's a great question and, and let me uh, answer it this way blockchain collects data so blockchain cannot be biased one way or the other. It just collects data. That's all it is, right? If you start collecting data on vaccines for people who are vaccinated and those who are not, uh, you're going to have governments being overthrown by other governments, right? Um, it's up to the individual if they want to be vaccinated or not. So they go there, they get a card or, well, you know, in some countries it's a card, others it's a piece of paper. But let me change the question or the example of the question. Let's say education. Uh, it's known in different countries that fake education certificates are the norm. 
I have an MBA from XYZ University in some, you know, in some African country or somewhere else, right? Uh, universities are looking at blockchain to ensure that they can justify and qualify that X student has received X qualifications, right? So there, uh, there are schools considering this now, not only in the UK, but also uh, around the world, we're saying, but if we start blockchaining education of students at a very young age, and we can follow that all the way through to university and a degree and a postgraduate degree and a doctorate, et cetera, that can be validated on a blockchain, right? That's inherent uh, for the university to qualify that. Again, it would be secured, right? That means if the uh, if a, a company wanted to validate that uh, uh, Miss Sunita has an MBA, which I know she has, uh, they would contact records of UWE and say, is this true? And then a blockchain code could be taken as a snapshot, which would identify you as having an MBA, right? Or the same for me for, for a doctorate, right? Um, where it gets difficult is when it starts to intrude on people's uh, decision process of whether I want it or not. Remember blockchain, it can be used anywhere. The question is, is it ethical um, and should it be used? Um, I. You know, here's a water bottle, right? It's plastic. I, I, I've been in the plastic industry for many, many years. Uh, should a plastic water bottle have a blockchain connected to it? Well, no, I don't think it should, right? Uh, for the, the you know, what would be the benefit, right? No, that I can see right now. But the organization and the processes could be part of a blockchain to ensure that the water inside right, is contaminant free. Because the plastic can come from somebody else. I could buy the plastic bottles from another organization. They might be part of a blockchain which says, where did you get the virgin from? That's the virgin flake that makes this, right? How is this? So that, that could be part of a blockchain or maybe not. Maybe only the water should be part of a blockchain because the water is what I consume. Right. The water is what I concern. Uh, and, 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 and this is the, the, the issue at the minute. Uh, should blockchain be deployed everywhere? I think in the future, uh, whether we like it or not, it will be as the technology becomes affordable. But that could be 10 years away, 15 years away. But right now, uh, IBM uh, and partners uh, of the Hyperledger, they're concentrating on food. Food has been, and that should be where we should be concentrating on at the minute food. We want to make sure it's contaminant free. It's not going to poison us, it's not going to kill us. And what we buy, if it says it's chicken, you know, we're buying chicken. We're not buying something which looks, you know, looks like chicken. So to answer the question in terms of, uh, could it be something that is like a track and trace for those who have been uh, given the jab, who've had the vaccine? Um, I'm sure the governments would say, yes, we should do it. Uh, but in reality, the people will probably revolt and throw the government out of power because they'll say, what about my right not to have the vaccine, right? Not to have the vaccine. I hope that's answered the question with the example of university. True, true. Sure, sure. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> uh, we, we are to, going to take one more um, and then we'll wrap it up uh, because of the time, um, of course. Uh, there's a question um, about the environmental impact by Deep Raj Karki. Uh, well, uh, well, you know, so far I can I can understand that blockchain is also considering the environmental impact for the fact that is hugely involving in in a matters like a food waste. But um, he is asking a question. Eventually, all of this won't matter if the planet is getting damaged in the process. So, what's the future regarding that aspect? Very prominent question indeed. Well, you know, ultimately, everyone has to be responsible for themselves. I'm going to go back to this plastic bottle because this plastic bottle has caused me nothing but trouble for the past five years, if not longer, when I worked within the plastic industry. I worked for a very large uh, multinational company in the UK that manufactures plastic, not plastic bottles, but plastic. And the issue isn't the plastic bottle that's polluting our waterways, polluting our ocean. The issue is untrained people who throw the bottle 
on the floor who don't in a recycling area or don't assist government in collecting waste. The problem isn't the planet and the bottle. The problem is the people living on the planet. I've worked in many, many countries and it's still mind boggling. You know, I remember working in the Philippines and uh, I decided to take a jeepney ride because it was quick and they get in a taxi and I was in the back of the jeepney and which is like a small minibus. Uh, I was only there for five minutes and people were opening up, you know, wrappers and plastic and just throwing it out the window. I mean, where, where did you think this plastic waste is going to go? You know, I'm in Thailand. Uh, people throw, you know, they're in the car park. They, they, they don't want to walk five meters to a bin in the car park. You're getting into the car. You just throw the bottle into the car park, hoping someone's going to be employed to scoop up the bottle, right? So uh, I, I, I have a strong feeling, you know, the world is going to fix itself when people start to be more tidy with their waste, right? We, uh, in the company I used to work for, we have multiple patents of plastic, state-of-the-art patents in plastic. And one thing that we really demand is recycle plastic, so recycle it. So we spend a lot of money buying recycled plastic waste bottles, particularly from a lot of the governments, uh, local governments around the UK, because we want to recycle uh, what we make is packaging, right? Um, and we use plastic in the manufacture of packaging. So we love to get these bottles, uh, drink bottles, because this is stage one plastic. This is a high concentration of virgin flake. So this is the best plastic. Why? Because you open the bottle and you put it to your mouth. Bottles are not made with grade two plastics. Not allowed. Right? Anywhere in the world, it's not allowed. So being a, food, a plastic manufacturer, we like to collect waste bottles, which are this type of bottles. Even if they're colored slightly, we can, we can eliminate the color. What happens? We have too much waste. We can't consume it. There's that much waste. We can't consume it. And the governments are exporting it to other countries in the hope that they're going to use it. They can't use it either because of too much waste. All right? So we have to, you know, we talk about saving the planet. It's not just about plastic waste. We have to be more environmentally friendly. Uh, let's talk about farming briefly before we end. You know, we need to feed people, number one, but we need to have the right type of seed if we talk about rice. We need to use fertilizer rather than pollutants, which are petroleum-based fertilizers. Some governments, uh, you know, I can mention Myanmar, uh, they're very petroleum-based fertilizer. Well, that's a contaminant to food, right? If it's not mixed correctly, it'll, it'll destroy uh, the soil, the nutrification, the soil will die, then this will filter down into the water table and then the water itself is contaminated. Uh, all, all sorts of uh, herbicides. You know, and China is responsible, uh, as being identified as being responsible, I should say, as being a, a huge pollutant. Uh, but that's not always the case. China has done a lot of work in electric vehicles, etc. So all governments need to continue this, this, this trek forward uh, yeah, in environmental um... concern. But the people need to adopt this. It's not all one-sided. And it's most definitely not the supply chain, right? The supply chain does nothing, only extract, manufacture, and deliver to the consumer at a, a, an agreed price. That's all our function is, right? The people themselves need to decide what's the best practice for them. And if there's a product on the market that they don't like or don't agree with, because they've identified that it's a pollutant, don't buy it. That organization will stop making money and go out, go out of business. So the hands, the power has always been in the consumer, right? It's not um, the supply sorry. chain. Excuse me. Um, yes. Patrick, uh, I was the one that, that asked that question. So. What, I'm, what you said was uh, absolutely right. So, but what I'm trying to say is the way I asked that question was from the point of view of the resources that these computers and technology use for running the blockchain. As you said, the blockchain could be used in a lot of fields, right? So eventually there could be a situation where a lot of industries use blockchain. And when you use so many computers, internet, and all those 
other technical stuff we might use a lot of energy uh, like which are not renewable so correct what i was trying to say was not just in terms of plastic but in terms of the technology and the resources that these technologies use and their impact on earth it's going to be huge i mean when you think about how many data centers google uses or how many data centers facebook uses or twitter uses if everyone decided tomorrow to to switch onto blockchain the, 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 you know, you'd have a country which would be a data center. I mean, just try and imagine the cooling requirement for a data center. It's phenomenal. Uh, I know Facebook and other companies have data centers uh, in cold countries because they're air cooled. These things are so hot. Microsoft has been uh, having data centers deployed in the ocean in the northern sections of Scotland, seeing how they're going to uh, cool down, right? So it's all about uh, how can we use that type of data center resource more effectively. Uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, uh, I mean, they're going to be the big supplier of data storage for blockchain. I know, you know, it's going to be the case where IBM is going to try and uh, have some kind of competitive advantage, but ultimately they don't have the data storage as AWS has, right? So there needs to be uh, probably a newer technology, which is probably going to be uh, created by a British company called ARM, Arm. Uh, they've recently come out with new servers, which are a, a third of the thickness of the Intel servers. I mean, in Intel's not gonna do very well out of this at all. And they use half as much power and they, and they, they cool down a lot faster. So it could be in the, in the next five to 10 years, all the data centers are gonna be ARM driven, uh, but they're still gonna need power to cool them down. Now, you might say, and I'm not saying this is an answer, but supply chain, and I, I encourage anyone who's interested in the supply chain to, uh, you know, to, to look at this. Supply chain is about trade-offs. Supply chain is not about moving a product. It's about people. So if you work in supply chain, you've got to be on very, very good people relationships, right? Whatever gets moved through a supply chain, that, that something does that. People don't do that. You know, a truck picks something up, goes here to there, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, so you're dealing with people. So supply chain is all about trade-offs. If we can save a uh, hundred billion every year on food spoilers, spoilages or wastages, well, that's gonna be great for the environment. But people are gonna start realizing, and IBM probably already know this, AWS know this already, Amazon, blockchain is intensively uh, data demanding because it's storing of data. Just look at the cryptocurrencies right now. How much data they consume. And, you know, I think there's about a thousand different cryptocurrencies that, you know, in the world of all shapes and sizes, which are heavily demanding on, on, you know, data and how it's stored, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the good points about the data collected in retail is it can expire and it can be deleted once the product has, you know, gone past a certain uh, time stamp, uh, you know, 10 days. Um, but there will be uh, a residue of information of traceability back to the farm. But, you know, there could be a reduction in the amount of data which is stored long term. But in many countries, data is stored legally for six years as a, as a legal requirement, right? So technology that's going to be deploying blockchain, that will have to advance as well. That will have to advance as well. Um, sure, sure. Thank but ultimately, you. the blockchain, uh, when we talk about supply chain, that's going to be the first stage. Right now, I think the World Wide Web can handle the next five to 10 years of blockchain development uh, through all the databases, you know, databases that are already out there. Um, but going forward, the, the, there'll need to be a, a, an understanding of what damage is this causing to the environment? We know this already from different databases, from different organizations worldwide. Right, like Facebook, like Google, let's just mention a few, because they're huge, they're huge in traffic both, both ways. It's a great question. Uh, it'd be nice to read some journal papers on, on this going forward over the next few years. So blockchain is not only going to impact the supply chain, both upstream, middle and down. It's not going to invite and offer uh, potential marketing benefits to consumers if they wish. Uh, it should show consumers and the world how we're saving uh, on waste, how we're uh, being able to track and trace and, uh, you know, remove as much as possible fakes
from within the supply chain. Um, but there should be some aspect that points towards the development or redevelopment of how it's going to impact the environment. Right? So blockchain itself isn't just a standalone. It's going to be integrated with us uh, for the rest of our lives. Sure. Patrick, do you have time for one more question? Sure. <laughs> All right. You know why I decided to pick this question? I did, this seems to be the last one because this is coming from such a layman's perspective. And then, you know, all of us, I would say like 80% of us are still in a stage of layman's for, to understand about the blockchain implementation in supply chain. So this question is very interesting. Um, it is from Vivek Khatiwada and it says, what if someone temper on the initial stage by adding a fake product as a real product in blockchain? Since it's on blockchain, people believe it's as the real one. How to prevent Genesis block altering on the real product? Yeah, and I, I touched on that uh, when we were talking. A blockchain uh, is a system of collecting data. Data is collected two ways. Human, eyes on the ground, right? And the second is Internet of Things or other sorts of application processes through a, you know, a machine process, etc. So it's, it's all data driven. When an engages in a procurement activity, right? So when we talk about procurement, logistics, supply chain, they're uniquely connected together. The procurement activity is where the initial blockchain will be created by the buyer and where it's being procured from, right? Well, that would have to be uh, eyes on the ground, a human who would say, right, this is all the pieces that's making my Gucci bag. And it's been assembled. And I, Patrick, with my unique identification, I've said these are all unique Gucci. So as we start the blockchain going through, it's going to be a Gucci product at the end or a Louis Vuitton product at the end or Coach product at the end, right? The moment it's found out to be a fake, that entire system, that structure, those people, they're investigated and reported to the police, right? It's instant because it's traceable. It's instant. And there's been cases like that already where people are, uh, you know, injecting. Uh, there was a case some years ago where uh, people were injecting oranges uh, with different drugs because they were, the farmers were complaining. Uh, this was all video recorded and they, they identified who the culprits were uh, right at the base where the oranges were being washed. They we're just injecting with syringe poison, right? Disgraceful. I disgrace. Well, those people were quickly found. Those people right. were quickly found. So eyes on the ground at uh, specific stages. A procurement officer would identify those stages before that company was approved as a vendor or seller, uh, and that's where the upgrade, right? upgrade to the blockchain. Uh, your unique identifier, Internet of Things, cameras. And don't forget, a supply chain doesn't start where the product begins because the product itself has its own supply chain, right? Its own supply chain. So we could say we're in a, a production area washing tomatoes and we're going to put six tomatoes in a plastic tray and wrap fast them, right? And they're going to be chilled and they're going to be delivered to Walmart. We could actually find out, well, where did the tomatoes come from? And track backwards. They came from this truck. This truck was refrigerated. There's a camera on the truck, right? In the UK, in the plastics industry, when the trucks are delivering products to the production facilities, there's a camera on the top of the truck at the back, which takes a picture uh, of the QR code of the gate, which is timestamped to say, I'm at this gate, which belongs to this company. And it's recorded. So there's no way that truck can be anywhere else. And the QR code and the taking of the timestamp matches the, uh, the grid reference of the GPS, which is in the front of the truck that says, yes, this truck is at this gate. Right. And this truck took two hours to go from the last location. And it went down this road, the M6, the M1, whatever. Right. So all that is trackable. It's all updated uh, directly to the block. Right. So you'd have to find where did the truck stop that allowed for this criminal activity to take place? Right. right. 
Sure. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure there will be many criminals who are going to attempt and they're going to try their best to inf in, 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 infiltrate into the blockchain, but they'll be they'll be caught out at some part of the chain and you know their, their, their products will be stopped. They won't be allowed to continue within the supply chain. We've not been able to do that before. Yeah. Right? We've not Absolutely. been able to do that before. And I hope that's answered the question. I'm sure. Um, Patrick, finally, you know, I've been thinking about, um, you know, at times we thought that is, is this topic uh, relevant? I'm sure it is, but then, you know, sometimes we think ahead of times, right? And then um, I was trying to contextualize about the relevancy um, of uh, implementing blockchain in, in, in context of Nepal. Um, and then you, you gave me, gave all us uh, this information about the barriers of implementing the um, mm. blockchain and the challenges that I was going through um, about implementing blockchain um, in the research paper that I referred to. Um, what, what do you think, your personal um, you know, insights on this, especially in context of Asia, countries like Nepal, India, Myanmar, when do you think these countries will be ready for the implementation of blockchain supply chain management amidst of the challenges and barriers that it has? I mean, that's a great question. I've spent a lot of time in Myanmar uh, four years before uh, I was kicked out of Myanmar when the military took over. Uh, in February, which was uh, quite disappointing. Um, if I talk about rice around Asia, rice is a, uh, it's a cultural product. People trading rice culturally, uh, rice traders know each other. I have done for many, many years. Uh, development of value added within rice varies country to country. Um, it's the Western world who are imposing, uh, as they've always done, uh, requirements such as uh, HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points, uh, ISO 9000 for uh, how things are processed, ISO 9001, why they're processed a certain way. And they're doing this because in the Western world, we realize that fake products are a booming industry. And we're trying to eliminate this because ultimately, Many of the buyers of products from Asia are in Europe or in America, right? And they're saying, look, if I'm spending money on rice that has come from India and it's jasmine, well, I want to make sure I'm you know, paying that because it's more expensive than rice, say, from Pakistan. I don't want Pakistani rice. I want Indian rice, for example. Um, or in the case uh, a couple of years ago where there was an organization producing plastic rice in China and mixing it with real rice and exporting it out. These were flakes of plastic, right? I mean, I just hope the Chinese government were able to find those people and deal appropriately. But this is uh, people, you know, uh, who, who are trying to make quick money, quick, a quick buck, so to speak, right? So this is driven predominantly by Western countries, Western buyers who are demanding that traceability is clearly labeled because governments have introduced this as regulation as law so the blockchain as it is right now in many countries they're demanding food safety regulations because of concerns and the retailers are saying we found this new thing it's kind of working for us a bit expensive right now but we're going to test it walmart's doing very well on leafy greens they're only doing it on leafy greens right Leafy greens, um, but within five years, if you go to some of the other information that is that I've uh, cited at the bottom, you'll find Walmart had a vision for this. They want it everywhere across their supply chain. And it's that strategy that I read, and, it, and you, you've got to understand the language when they talk about how wonderful and great it is. Great for who? Great for them. So they can visualize their supply chain. Great for the consumer who buys them. The supplier, we don't know if it's great for them or not, because it depends on the Walmart buying power, uh, whether they're going to be favorable to the suppliers or harsh. Maybe they can say, well, let's reduce the suppliers down to one or two who meet this criteria, and then those suppliers deal with everybody else. Right? I think it's going to be a long time coming to Asia in food. Um, 
But saying that, there's uh, fisheries, uh, fishing boats that fish around uh, Asia who uh, are using blockchain in various canneries, but that tuna is sold in US stores, right? So companies that decide to take on uh, the going to blockchain, they will be, uh, they'll have direct, direct access to the global retailers because they've already done it. So big organizations, private labels, um, luxury goods, they're doing their own blockchain as we speak, as we speak, right? Because they're, look, they're looking to protect their brand. But more global in food, that's going to take a little bit longer. And predominantly, you know, grains, linguines, uh, you know, mangoes, melons, all, you know, fish, uh, farm fish, I don't know, in poorer countries, uh, they're not going to be able to introduce blockchain. Uh, they're just not going to be able to do it. Um, but fishing companies, large fishing boats, uh, where they're uh, catching the fish, the location is here. The fish, uh, the boat was called this. Uh, it's been uh, produced and chopped and canned in a factory in Thailand. This is the blockchain code, and now it's being sold in America. That's being done already as we speak, right, for the American market. Sure. Sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure. Thank you, um, Patrick. What a wonderful, uh, interesting, My pleasure. insightful 2.5 hours. And thank you for giving us this extra 24 minutes. I know, I know you're very tight in your schedule. And can I please allow me to um, pass my sincere thank you for your time, for your for your you know um, content and every every uh, you know, everything that you've agreed on so far. Um, I would I would hope that we can arrange such session again as a part of TVC Distinguished Guest Lecture Series, and um, and I would also like to thank you to all the participants who stayed here with us. Um, you know, part of the reason why we organized this session at seven in the morning is to be very mindful about the working professionals uh, who start their work at nine. And I can see yes. that people are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's why we do it. Thank you for your um, your participation. The question. My pleasure. Answered. Thank you for the invitation. No worries, Patrick. If um, just a quick update on the participants. If you'd like to, you know, ask more questions and want to know more about it, please uh, contact us. You know, via Facebook. Um, I can make sure that I can, you know, pass that questions to Patrick, and maybe we can organize another session on this topic. You never know. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Patrick. I'll I'll see you on the, um, you know, in email. And thank you, everybody. You guys take care. Keep safe. Keep safe. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Yep, great question. Well done. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.